notice board, some signage, and basically adopted uh, on online and and in and in person as as ours and things we're responsible for. So, but in, introducing introducing them to uh, to uh, people who don't know about it. So the the first one, the one we've been involved in, um, our group and the people in it have been involved in longest is the is the bridge houses footbridge, the bridge the bridge that goes nowhere on the roundabout, bridge houses roundabout, and quite a few people in Sheffield know this and drive past it or go past it um but the the the, the background of this is the friends group have been going about six years and there was a a, a, a derelict rotting um bridge in the middle of a roundabout which has been cut off by Derek Dooley way and um and doesn't go anywhere so it's it's not only in the middle of a roundabout it was only accessible from one end comes up against the, the, the wall at the other end but until just 20 or 30 years ago it was a busy crossing and is on the on the site of previous crossings, and is in fact one of the world's first was one of the world's first iron bridges in 1795. So only a decade after Iron Bridge itself, um, it's certainly Sheffield's first iron bridge. It's thought to be one of the first ten iron bridges in the world. The original the original structure, um, right. and it was on the site of a 17th century wooden bridge. It's also thought by some to be a to be the a crossing uh, the Roman crossing of the of the Don. Um, it's on a convenient little bend in the river, and it's very it's often shallow there um, and, and quite narrow. So, but the the when the French group took it over, it was it was derelict. They they basically cut back all the foliage and broke into it. Um, they and um, and the, the long and short of the story is that it was uh, uh, a late friend of mine, uh, John Errington, died three years ago, who who left me. Uh, the bridge um it's the only thing i've ever been left in my life and it was a derelict victorian bridge so it's all you know it's all it's all good and um, we were kindred spirits on these uh, sort of heritage projects and that's where our group has, has stepped in with the original group um and this is the view most people have this is the view from the from the the, the road um the cut off at this end it's cut off so they they've broken into it, accessed it, and the original friends group. I mean, they, quite literally, they broke the they broke the, the locked gate and cut back all the, the hedgerow, painted, did it up, tidied it up, and um, had a had a reopening. And John was a uh, remarkable character in a lot of ways, and he he managed to get the bridge officially reopened by the then Lord Mayor, even though we he'd broken into it. You know, he he'd, um, he'd basically trespassed on a bit of their their, their site. Taken it over, did it up, and um, uh, and got the, the official stamp of, of, uh, of them reopening it. And it's a great example. I love it as an example um, of what, what what groups like us can do. Um, we've this is it from the from the vantage point that that people know. And it's it's it, you know historic crossing. Uh, looking at the press stuff going back, it's it's been important enough to be a crossing for for centuries. Um, Sheffield's first railway, second railway station, one of Sheffield's first railway stations used to be adjacent to it, um, but it was also the entrance to the city from that side of the city. And you can see some of the notice boards on the on the site there that were the original ones. Also at the far end of the bridge, there's a museum type uh, um, uh, story storyboard there, um, and that's the that's the, the site now. But also um, we've made a little nature reserve at this end of the bridge on the roundabout there's now a we've planted several trees and the council have planted a wild flower bed so in the spring and the summer it's a, it's a it's a real nature reserve look and it is in the quite literally in the middle of a busy roundabout um but we've installed benches and, and a path and made it a spot where people um go and go and visit and find out about as well and i think that's uh, it's but it's the longest running of things we've done and really still the benchmark for me of a community, uh, the, the group taking involved in these things, i.e. we did stuff first and asked for permission second uh, and it's worked to, to, to do that and it's, it's, it's carried on since and, and basically it's ours now and it's that, that's the thing once you, you, you carry on, you, you establish yourself, you, you um, uh, find yourself in, in, in charge of it, find yourself running it and it's... Uh, and it's great, and to, yeah, encourage people to go down, get, go down there that are in Sheffield. Um, this is one of the original bits of signage that John and friends did, uh, showing the maps going back to the 1700s, where the crossing is is clearly um, is clearly marked. And yes, that's my uh, that's 
basically where the the, two, the other two sites that, that we'll, we'll, we'll get to are, are pretty much based on what the group had done before we were involved, but also since we were involved as well, i.e. industrial heritage and nature spot combined into one. Um, and also just um, sticking your, your signage up there, sticking those, your notice boards up and sort of making laying claim really to, to, to a site. It's definitely worked for bridge houses. It's definitely become a known spot for people um, without originally any permission to do any of that. And so we've now got this, uh, also I should say, we've now got a working relationship with the council and Amy, the, the contractors, um, they do their planting and gardening. We do our planting and gardening. We work around each other's stuff and there's a sort of tacit uh, acceptance that we, that, that we're sort of you know, jointly doing this doing this work and it's, uh, um, it's it's working well and it's definitely something I'd like to I would I would do it in the same way uh, elsewhere. Um, one in a different a different way, one that we've discovered as a group and one that is ours and um, and came from uh, underground exploring came from a few of us, me and Roger and a few others, urban exploring, getting our, our waders on and our wet gear and going. Uh, uh, going through the culverted part of the porter um, walks and uh, this is the on, on, on my walks along here this is the under the decathlon uh, bramall lane bridge and this is 1846 it's it's the, probably one of just about the first major work carried out by the new town council formed in 1843 and it opens up sheffield to that side uh, sheffield to that um, side of what's now highfield Healy, etc was, was just villages outside the city one of the first things they do is proper road bridge access over the river and out into into that side of the of the, of the city. Um, it leads to our, again our work with Decathlon, which has been great. Um, we've we've done some joint working with them and shared information between both of us. And it is just this is obviously this is a slightly different. So comparison to bridge houses, this is almost completely hidden. Bridge houses is one of those sort of, uh, sort of partially forgotten, sort of slightly mysterious, what's it doing in the middle of the roundabout type thing. This is virtually hidden and only seen, only available to be seen from, from one end. Um, hopefully that may change. There's some opening up of Sheffield rivers and uh, culverted rivers um, being planned. And it may be that both ends of this end up being visible, but it's very important and completely lost in terms of, I think, sort of think we rediscovered it. I, th I think it's, it took a couple of visits before I realised that there was something there that wasn't just a culvert, that there was, there was built into the culvert was a, a structure, an entirely complete structure as well. Um, and interestingly, it, it disappears off the maps in the mid 19th century. It's only on the maps for about 20 years. And as the city, as the town grows up around it, and as the culverts grow, um, I get, you know, because the more the river gets culverted, uh, it disappears. It's only, it only appears on the urban survey map once in 1855, and then uh, within 20, 30 years, it's, it's gone. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's no longer worthy of uh, um, being marked on the map, and it's, which is, which is interesting. Um, and we've now got information boards at both ends in Decathlon and in the former Staples car park on the other side of, of Air Street, um, which is again another thing, definitely a lesson I learned from bridge houses. Get you. Do you do a, put a couple of notice boards up, information boards up, and um, reclaim it? And uh, and a lot of people have, have noticed that those signs have have gone down well, and we'll see in a minute has got some got some uh, publicity. Um, this is a fantastic photograph taken by Jules, one of our, our colleagues in during, in an underground explore. Um, the bridge itself is a hundred meters long and curved all the all the way around in one gentle curve. It's a fa fantastic structure. Um, and this is almost halfway. You can see the daylight at each end when you stand around halfway. Um, on the on the left of this, the bank there, um, when me and Roger have been down there, we found uh, um, shells, uh, uh, oyster shells, shells from discarded food, from Victorian lunches um, on that bank. We've also found a Victorian inhaler, the remains of a Victorian inhaler, because next to it was a, a steelworks, a uh, Vulcan steelworks. Um, so there's just this, that bank is just virtually untouched by by the by the river and the water and there was just scraping the surface you find the fine victorian things in there um but it's a great view of the just just a, 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 a remarkable remarkable structure and incredibly intact and and next to it where the decathlon car park has collapsed twice in the last four years uh, the surveyors for decathlon have been under there and they've had they're in all these problems the 1950s and 1960s structure that's under their car park um is 
vulnerable, dangerous. They've had to close part of their car park off. But this itself carries a main road still, carries Air Street, a main entrance into the city. Um, there's nothing wrong with this. This doesn't, you know, this has not lost a, a piece of stone out of it. And yet there's a thing 100 years uh, more modern next to it, which has literally fallen in twice. Um, this is, is quite quite extraordinary. It's holding up the, the modern stuff on, on either side of it. Um, and yeah, that's something I this uh, thing I, th I think uh, as a group, this this is entirely ours. It's entirely ours that, that we've discovered it, identified it, written about it, and started the, the group. Um, this is the other end. This is the decat. The this is the the bit on the ceiling. There is the is the uh, where it collapsed, and that's the temporary the temporary uh, floor of their car park in Decathlon. Just above it, people on my Porter Brook walk, we stop and we stop on the spot here, but we can't see into it. So the walls on the left are river river walls. This was open until the mid twentieth century, up to the to the bridge itself. But that's the other end of the bridge. The, the other end is slightly visible in the trees. Um, this end isn't. This is entirely artificially lit, and uh, this is not visible from any vantage point. But that's how the road bridge would have looked at uh, at, at, at that end. You can see when you you know how how low it is and you go through the culverts and you see it's a separate a separate structure um but that's yeah that's where that has all fallen in and then that bridge arch is is still there where where it is um and that hopefully that'll be the view one day hopefully that will be opened to that to that far and be able to see both ends and that will that will create a great deal more awareness of the of the bridge if we can see it from from both sides from both ends which you can only see it from one side now and this inside, but the thing is, it's been um, everything inside. It's been protected. It's, it's virtually no one goes down there. There's, there's, uh, uh, it's a bit of a, a time capsule. This is the, uh, the, the steelworks that used to be next to it. This is the tail goit. This is the, the channel carrying the water back into the river after it gets taken out of the river to power the water, the water wheel. Um, in amazingly good condition. These are usually bricked up or silted up, um, buried. But he's, there's a really, really good condition red brick. Uh, channel in there with me looking looking into it um it's just naturally filled with a bit of silt but other than that it's it's um uh, it's it's a beautifully intact uh example uh, of it um and uh, yeah another another advantage of having something hidden and and not being accept, accessed by people except people like us who, who put the wet gear on and go and have a poke around down there and the fantastic thing and one of the best things that ever happened to anything I've ever written about local history is we put that board up in December 2019 and in January 2020 uh the Sheffield United this is the Sheffield United match program against Manchester City uh, in January last year and the Sheffield United club historian John Garrett had read the information board that me and Roger put up and he wrote a three-page article in the match program leading to me owning a Sheffield United match program for the, for the only time um Three page, this is the first page, building a bridge for Bramall Lane. And just firstly, it's fantastic that Premier League football programme has a three page local history article in it. Um, but yeah, it's a regular, regular piece of their programme. And he, he wrote, it's just an excellent article, which is on the Friends of Bramall Lane Bridge Facebook page in its entirety. Um, and he, he talks about how basically Bramall Lane is built in 1855 as a cricket ground, very early ground. Bramall Lane wouldn't be where Bramall Lane is if it wasn't for Bramall Lane Bridge. So it's, it's just, um, uh, it's just, just, yeah, that was fantastic. And I was over the moon when uh, he contacted me on Facebook to say he'd written this article because I wasn't aware he was doing it until after it happened. Um, but basically talking about, you can see there in the opening paragraph about how that, the fields on that side of the city became, started to be developed and that was where they put the, put the cricket ground. And uh, that's why Sheffield United play where they do now. So that was a fantastic example of putting a, information board up and someone with that the ability to go and do that uh, the, the, the leads from it you know so I was slightly pleased when that happened it means we're targeted slightly by Sheffield Wednesday fans graffiti in it but you know we can't do, can't do much about that um and another one uh more most recent site we've we've adopted a couple of years ago Watersmeet Island which is the the confluence of the river the Rivlin and Loxley over at Mailing Bridge um we've done this in in uh, collaboration with another group I'm involved in, uh, a green heritage group. Um, so we look after, this is very much a green site, but it's also got loads of industrial archaeology. 
um, and I, they're very similar to bridge houses. It's got your weirs and your, the your stone structures and the remains of where water wheels and water powered industry used to be. It's also another another city centre piece of nature, again in the middle of a very busy road uh, um, layout. Um, and it is the only natural confluence of Sheffield's rivers. Uh, all, all Sheffield's main rivers join underground or in drains or culverts or under under the station in one case this is the only place where the two rivers naturally meet uh, in in there uh, as they should do and so it's formed formed an island and it's formed uh, this is the so this is the view from the from the road um that's the rivlin off to the left and the loxley straight ahead and that's the the island in the middle there uh, is cut off by a, a cutting by another water channel on the far side before <laughs> the road um and it's created an island it's created an island where uh which is just the nature just takes it over once that happens but it's a beautiful spot um and it's got something there for everybody uh, heritage wise and this is the this is the cutting this is the fantastic thing about this so just short so you've got a weir there you've got a weir on the opposite side this is the river inside and in 1753 this cutting was was made and it's borrowing a little bit of water from the river in putting it into the loxley 20 or 30 yards short of the confluence in order to create a bit more water going over a weir on the opposite side. So you've got a small weir on this side, small weir on the opposite side, and you've got this amazing little cutting that just runs slightly downhill and takes water at enough power to power, so that this weir is powered, this weir here is powered, but also the one on the opposite side. And it's a, 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 I've never seen anything else like it. It's, it's a unique spot. There probably wouldn't be a need for anything else like it anywhere else in the city, um, but it creates the island. You've got the rivers on two sides and that creates the island and so that cuts the whole thing off for, for nature to to thrive um and i just yeah just it's fantastic uh, a piece of piece of infrastructure and we do work there with environment agency and it's been been quite good the environment agency and the river stewardship company because after the 2000 2007 the big summer flood um this was the environment agency's flood prevention policy um, and they did this. And so what we saw just a couple of uh, couple of slides ago, this is entirely grown since uh, just over the last 12 years. Um, I think this is in 2009. And this was, yes, this was their policy for alleviating flood. It's no longer their policy. And this isn't about whether people think we should be cutting down trees or not. It's, uh, it's, it's flood prevention. They now have a different attitude to flood prevention. And so we work with them on the on the site we've had an open day with them jointly with them and uh with um, yes it's another it's a good example i think of that i think there please someone's looking after the site this is a major flood risk place it's where two rivers join i mean this is somewhere they that they're happy to have somebody looking out for looking after but you can see how different um it looks with uh with what they did what they did there um so and add a good example yes hopefully an example of, of joint working as well because you, you once you plant your flag on one of these sites um you then start to look around and hopefully have the council amy environment agency and all the other people um with you but if you have to do that you have to start working first and get them to get them to join you rather than the, the other way around and they of course get a group of people to do something for nothing in looking after a site so it really should be a a win for everybody but I, th I think on the big screen that was my last uh, that was my last slide so um there are there are sites three different sites but with similarities and links as well excellent thank you very much calvin that's great